Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be talking about troubleshooting your field coils in your AC Pullmore motor and your Lionel trains. Now this isn't a wire that normally goes bad unless it has been abused or mistreated. So I will show you some troubleshooting procedures on how to find out that if it is bad. Here in front of me is my T1 Reading locomotive and since I rebuilt it, it still has been running at nearly half speed. I did find that the armature was shorted out and I did rewind the armature. So that took care of one problem, but it still ran slow. So I'm not sure what's going on. I have eliminated all of my mechanical possibilities and now I'm, I am narrowing down to a couple of items. So the field coil may be a suspicious item. So I'm going to go ahead and troubleshoot this and see that, it, see that if it is the problem. So let's get started on this and let's see that if the coil is bad. You may think that just by taking your digital multimeter and testing the field coil that this will tell you that if your field winding is bad. And this is not always the case. And all this is doing right now is just measuring the resistance of the magnetic wire in this field. So this doesn't really tell me anything other than that uh, it looks like that it is good. But again, it's not always telling me the case just by measuring this coil resistance. So we're going to have to apply other technologies to this to see that if there is any issues. The one tool that I like to use is a Megger. This will send 1000 volts DC into the field coil and see if there's any voltage leakage from the coil up to the metal frame here of the motor. And this is a very effective tool to see if there are any leaks at all. So why, how would I get any leak from this field coil onto the motor housing? Well, I mean the motor, the armature is right here. So if we over lubricate, we get oil splatter on the field windings. If we get carbon dust all over this from the field winding, across this plastic housing to the uh, to this metal frame of the motor. I mean, we can detect leakage that way, so which means that your motors can run hot and it can affect the performance of your locomotive. So this test is very simple. All we do is that we take a lead, it could be red or black, and we're going to put it on one of the field windings. And for this test, you have to separate the field windings from the motor entirely for this test, or else you might read um, you might read something else in the circuitry. And we're gonna take the other clip, and these are magnetic. And we're gonna put it right over to the motor frame or any other metal onto the locomotive, it doesn't matter. And when we push the red button, we're gonna see that this on light comes on. Now we're sending 1000 volts DC into this to see if there's any leakage from the coil to the motor. Even though that this is covered in plastic, again, lubricants and carbon dust can jump from the field winding across the plastic insulator to the motor housing. Now, if there was any leakage, I would see these LEDs light up. So we got anywhere from 1,000 mega ohms up to 150 mega ohms, which is in the good area. So if any of this lit up, it would show that the motor is still good, but we can use a cleaning. Anything less than that, it would have to be observed more to find out what's really happening with this. So again, carbon and lubricants is a way that voltage can transfer from the field winding to the motor casing. If you do suspect any dust, you can use CRC Electronic Cleaner or WD-40 spe Specialist Contact Cleaner. It is made for, for sensitive electrical parts, and you can clean off the field coil with, with any of these choice cleaners. Just be sure to take off the brush plate and remove the uh, armature if you can. Hold the locomotive with this facing down and then just spray away. This stuff will dry fast and will remove any of the dust on here, and hopefully that will cure or fix one of the issues. Another test that I would like to do to the field coil is a heat resistance test. Now what that imposes is me putting a voltage through the coil, which will induce some current. And what's gonna happen is that these coils are going to heat up. And this will tell me if there is a problem with the coil that a digital multimeter cannot tell us. So for this test, I have a CW80 transformer hooked up and I have these two 18 gauge wires. One wire comes from the power supply hooked up to one end of the coil. The other end here is connected to a heavy duty wire, a 12 gauge wire with a heavy duty clip which goes to my, uh, other, to my other digital multimeter with some heavy duty audio clips. And this is designed to handle that kind of current. I wanna use large wire for current testing this way that I have no inline wire resistance to give me false readings. Even though that these lines are short, I still like to use larger wires. So this meter is gonna be used for my current reading, and this meter is gonna be used for my voltage reading. 
So I'm going to take this clip and I'm going to connect it to the alligator clip and the other wire here to the other alligator clip. And I just want to see what kind of voltage I'm going to get. And I want to shoot for around two amps of current to go through this field coil. So we're going to illuminate this meter and we're going to turn on the power. Now from here, as we see, as we increase power, voltage is increasing and our amps is increasing as well too. And I want to be around, around two amps, which I'm pretty happy with that reading right now. So I'm going to test this for about two minutes and see what happens right after that. Okay, so our two minutes is up and these readings really haven't changed at all, which is what I was hoping for. So what happened here is that we're running almost eight volts AC into the field coil and we're almost putting out two amps of current through this whole coil. Now this heated up the coil pretty significantly and it feels rather warm to the touch. It actually feels warmer than that, which is what I wanted. So what happens is that I first started off with 1.95 amps and the current dipped down a little bit, which is what I want to see in a good coil. Because what happens is that with these copper windings, when it heats up, the copper expands and that helps create some resistance in the wire separating the molecules and the electrons in the coil here. So you will see a dip in current, which is what we're seeing right now. The purpose of the heat resistance test is to find this gouge or break in this magnetic copper wire. Now, let's just say that if this wire was solid, current is going to flow through this without an issue. But because that we had this pre-pending break or gouge in this wire, it's going to be a lot harder for the current to flow through the wire through this little area. It's almost like if you pinch a water line, you're not going to get the full water flow at the tap. So when the wire starts to heat up, this area right here becomes part of the circuit increasing resistance. So as the copper expands, so it does here as we're trying to push all this current through this area, is this area is going to heat up a lot more and again increasing resistance and the current is going to drop drastically. So when I was reading 1.92 amps on my meter after two minutes, this area here you might read 1.5 amps, 1.2 amps. You, you, you could even read as low as 0.8 amps on your meter and that would indicate that there is a problem with the magnetic wire and, and it would have to get replaced. Now let's say that the cut or gouge in the wire was not as deep. Chances are that you may not even see that high of a drop in current because that there's still enough copper here for the current to flow through into the wire. However though, just by looking at this on paper, it is an area of interest because if you are drawing more current than normal, this would be an area that could fault in time. Even though you can't see it, it's still potential to happen. And either way, through both situations, if you use your digital multimeter to read the continuity between the wire, you would not even read these faults. You would only read continuity. So what happens if we see an increase of current during testing? Well, that tells me that the enamel on the field winding is dissolving and that the magnetic wire is making better contact with itself. So how that happens is that one way, someone is using too much oil or even harsh oil on the armature as lubrication and that it splatters over the field winding and that oil penetrates through, a se through several layers of the field winding through vibration and heat differences causing the enamel to dissolve which makes all of the copper wire make better contact with itself. That's one way. Another way is that someone has used a harsh cleaner like alcohol, paint thinner, stuff that you're not supposed to put on, on the field winding to get rid of any dust or oil. And that can penetrate several more layers because it is a thinner liquid, dissolving the enamel, increasing conductivity of the magnetic wire, which increases current. So 
If you see an increase of current, you're going to have to replace the magnetic wire because the problem is only going to get worse. Now let's talk about double field windings. Double field coil windings are what they are. It's just two wound wires inside of this plastic insulator to direct current in either direction to make the armature spin clockwise or counterclockwise for the locomotive to go forward or backwards. And all this switching is done by this, by this reversing unit, whether it toggles in one direction or the other. Now you can go ahead and troubleshoot this using the heat resistance tests and clean it if need be. But with this, there, there was nothing wrong with this Alco motor unit. Uh, so I'm just doing a demonstration for when we do the mega test because it is a double winding field and how can we properly troubleshoot this using two windings on here. So we're going to get our mega and we're going to connect one clip to the frame and you know it is magnetic so that's fine. And we're going to take the other clip and we're going to put it to the red wire and we're going to push the button. Now, of course, the light comes on, and I do not see it. I do not see any LEDs light, so that is a good sign. Let's go here to the green wire on this side, and it could be the green wire, you know, over here or in here. It doesn't really matter as long as you are making a connection. And let's push the button. Okay. So we got nothing there. If you saw the the uh, the lights light up on here, it's because that the clip touched the. Um, the uh, spring on there for the for the truck. Now let's go ahead and do a green to red mega test. We're going to take the red, put it on one wire, the black on the other, and we're going to push the button. Whoa! What happened? I never saw that before, and I think I have a theory on what happened. So I drew a picture using red and green markers of what our double field winding looks like. All it is is just two wires that are just wrapped around each other uh, in a plastic insulator for the motor's operation. So we're going to have a, the green wire, red and green wire, and red wire leads sticking out of the field winding which go to the motor's brush plate for the armature's operation. The reversing unit is going to operate for the first time and it's going to send current through, through one of the fields, let's say in a clockwise rotation, out and it's going to make the armature spin in a clockwise rotation. And when the uh, reversing unit switches over to its other side, it's going to send current through the second field, let's say in a counterclockwise rotation, causing the armature to spin in a counterclockwise rotation. And it's only through AC electricity that we have these positive and negative pulses in this wave that help with this energy transfer because, it, because this is what AC current and voltage was designed to do. You will, you will not get that with DC whatsoever. With DC, however, you will have a pulse when the power supply first starts off, and then it will regulate out to whatever that it is supposed to be. 5, 10, 15, 24 volts, 48 volts, or even for, for my Mega, 1,000 volts. So when I used my Mega on the double field coil, I took my two clips, put them on the two fields, the red and green fields, and I pushed my button, and I sent out that 1,000 volt DC pulse. The Mega picked up on its own magnetic field thinking that there was a short and sent the LEDs to the top of the meter thinking that the motor or that the windings were bad. Now because that the DC did regulate itself out and the enamel on the magnetic wire aided in the resistance of the DC trying to find a short in the windings, the LEDs started to go down the meter increasing resistance telling me that the, that, that the double field windings are good. All I'm basically saying that is if you see the LEDs on the Mega go up and then back down again and disappear, your field windings are good. But if you see that the LEDs are maintained on the lower end of the megometer, then they probably need a cleaning and nothing more than that, you know, just to get off any of the dust and oil that might be on there. But if you see that the readings are on the upper end, which shows a lower resistance reading, then you are probably going to have to replace the field windings. You're going to have to gain access to the field windings of the motor and you're going to have to rewind them with the same gauge wires but of two different colors so this way you do not get them confused once you reassemble the motor again. You have to pay attention on which way that the wires are wound and how these two windings are put together because you don't want to have the windings too loose or too far apart from each other because the motor will not operate properly. 
To get to our field coil, we're going to have to remove the AC Pulmar motor completely from, from the locomotive, remove the armature and everything else, leaving us just a motor frame by itself. Now, if you have some sort of nut looking items on top of your motor here, you're going to want to remove those because those are probably holding in these, um, these metal uh, claps in here for the motor's operation. But you know, every motor is going to be put together differently. So this is in a way kind of cheating, but here we have a screw on the bottom of this motor and we're going to remove it. And this stud will just come right out. Now this other stud is riveted in place and we're gonna to have to drill that out. I'm taking a 1 8 inch drill bit and I'm going to drill this out and see the best method possible. I'm gonna try and go at an angle because this is how I was able to get out the studs on my ZW transformer. Nope. I did find that a larger drill bit worked for this. Uh, I used an 11 64ths, but even I could use a 3 16ths, but you wanted to get rid of, of that star rivet on the bottom of this motor. So I'm just going to use this old screwdriver as a punch and I'm going to push out this other pin inside of this motor. Now once the pins or the studs are removed, the whole motor separates. Now we're going to want to find out the gauge wire that's on this motor and well, I'll be darned. <laughs> the wire is broken on this one. Amazing. I was just talking about this and yep, this one has happened and it broke. And it's on the outside of the coil, not on the inside like this guy here. So I'm just going to peel this guy off because, whoa. I guess this one was more brittle than I realized. So I guess that's why it's a good thing it's a donor motor. So to find the gauge of this wire, I have this stainless steel wire gauge, which I got from Amazon. And if you take off a little bit of the enamel, which if you see a little bit of the copper on here, we're going to put it through one of these slots and see which one is the right gauge. So it's not 25. It definitely feels like it's 24, 24 gauge. So even when you're going to test this wire, it's best you want to take a pair of needle nose and try and straighten out this wire as best you can. And then try and put it into the slots or else you might get the wrong size wire for this motor. So putting it through this over again, yeah, it's definitely 24 gauge wire. So how much wire are we going to need for this field winding? Well, since the wire originally did start up here at the corner, we are going to consider this area as our counting area. So as we un unravel this, like if this was up here, we're going to start unraveling. We're going to call that one, two. And as we do this, we just want to see how the wire is situated in the field and how it's wound. So you want to remember how this is wound up because rewinding this, you want to have a nice tight field for the magnetic transfer for the motor. And once we get this unwound, we're going to see how much wire we're going to need and then rewind it back again. 148. 149, 150, 151 wraps. And I measured out a total of 28 feet of 24 gauge magnetic wire. So right before I rewind my field winding, I had to repair my, my plastic insulator, which broke right here, right when I was gonna pull the wire out of, this, uh, out of these two holes. But it broke before I even applied any, any major amounts of pressure on here. So that tells me that this thing is brittle uh, from, from heat exposure from this motor running. So I just glued it in place using a, a, a plastic epoxy weld, but I don't want to reuse this piece just in case it might break here, but I want to hold it in place using this glue so that the wire will not fall out. So I took one that was not broken on here and I went to drill a 564 hole that you see on your left side here. And lo and behold, I did not put a lot of pressure on it that the side wall here did crack. And I had to fix it again with some, uh, some plastic epoxy weld and wait for that to cure and I drilled another hole to the right which is 564 but I did not apply a lot of pressure and took a little while to drill but it's well worth the effort because I want to have this wall here as strong as I can so when I rewind this thing that the wire does not fall off of this here. So anybody that wants to do this, these things are very brittle. If you could find them as a replacement, great, but you're going to have to glue them back in place if you do break them. 
I've installed 3 quarter inch long 440 screws and nuts on the field plates just to keep the whole assembly together while I rewind the field. And to help aid in the rewind of the field from Amazon, I got this Vision Aid magnifier and we open it up. We got a set of magnifiers here uh, at different strengths and with the headpiece itself, I have a three and a half times lens installed and it can be adjusted, swayed any way you want and it also has LED lights on here so you can see in those dark areas. I think it's really important to have this as a tool to use when you rewind fields uh, and your armatures because you want to be able to see that wire going up against itself when you are rewinding these items. You don't want to have any kind of loose ends or anything in these little areas here because if you do it just takes away from the magnetic field and it makes your rewind look sloppy. The wire I am using for the rewind is Temco Industrial 24 gauge magnetic wire. One and a half pound reel that I have here in my hand yields almost 1200 feet of wire. So I think I have plenty of wire for, for future rewinds to come. So I have already cut 28 feet of my 24 gauge ma magnetic wire and I have it strung out towards the front of the basement. Now why I cut it off is because that when I start rewinding it on my field insulator here, this winding action is going to cause the magnetic wire or any wire for that fact to kind of coil backwards towards the end. And if I left this on the reel, well, it would just be a disastrous mess. So to start winding this up, um, I'm just going to use one of these older holes here on the bottom to just to hold this wire in place. So I'm probably just going to have about, about a good four to six inches sticking out. And I'm going to keep the wire as close as I can to the wall and then I'm going to start winding it up. So in the process while doing this, that you're going to want to keep the wire as close to the wall as you can during the, re during the rewind process. Now of course you see that I have fingernails, um, long fingernails in my hands and that sometimes is beneficial when you are rewinding either uh, fields or armatures because you could just take your nail and just kind of push the wire over a bit if you have to. And I prefer not to use tools because they can potentially gouge the wire in places where you don't want them to. So let's start the rewind on this field. And here we have the final product of a fully wound field of an AC Pullmore motor. Now this took me about an hour to do, uh, and, and that's considering of the size of the uh, field uh, insulator on here, and plus it's just one wrap going around the entire insulator, and it's also a larger gauge wire. Aiding with this too, you got to have these ma these magnifier glasses. They help they help out tremendously to see the detail in between the wires and winding this up, so that you can keep these wires close together inside of the insulator and it will keep the windings nice and neat. Okay, so now that we have everything rewound, let's put the motor back together. Oh, don't forget, we gotta take these screws off too. Once you take the screws out, the whole assembly will stay together. This stud here already had a threaded end on it, so we're gonna put this back in first and we're gonna snug down on this screw just for now, just to hold in the motor together. It's this stud that we're going to have to work on because this one does not have a threaded end and this is where the stamp was for the rivet. So we're going to have to drill and tap this out. I have my studs secured in a pair of vice grips because I don't want to use my fingers to hold on to this piece and risk piercing my fingers with a number 51 drill bit in my Dremel tool. So this bit, the number one bit, uh, I'm sorry, the number 51 drill bit is good for 256 screws uh, when you're going to drill and tap holes and I'm using gyros carbon steel drill bits so I got everything here from Amazon and it is easily accessible in my cup here I have some three-in-one oil as a lubricant so let's go ahead and drill out the hole in our stud I went in about a half inch with my drill bit and this is because when we retap this hole all of the threads are not going to go all the way through and that there's going to be a tapered end on the tap when I insert it into the hole. So at times the deeper the better and we could put a longer screw in here for better security. This is a 256 tap and this is the smallest tap I've ever used. 
I don't have the right T handle for this, so I'm using a pair of needle nose pliers. As long as I take my time, everything should go fine. So I have a 256 screw that is a quarter inch long inserted into the hole and I have a two millimeter inner diameter and three millimeter inner diameter washers right behind each other just so I can increase the surface pressure. And we're going to screw this in place. And I also placed 242 Loctite on the threads for its, uh, for its placement so it will not vibrate out. With the donor motor fully assembled, we can now test its newly rewound field coil. So we have another successful motor project with a donor motor that now has a newly wound field. I couldn't have been more excited and pleased to see the motor operate as it once should have. So I am very excited to see that I can do more fields in the future and I hope I can rebuild a motor fully one day, armature and field, and get it running again. It does take patience, it does take time, but believe me, when you do it, you get satisfactory results, guaranteed. And knowing that you did it, it just makes it I say, more special for your trains because you did the work. And this doesn't go for AC Pullmore motors. I mean, I mean, anything in Lionel that has a field in it with an armature, you can work on it and you can rewind it. I've done two armatures already and you can go to my channel and check out on how to rewind Lionel armatures. And it seems int intimidating, but it's not, and I hope, again, it inspires you, inspires anybody else who wants to fix Lionel trains, you know, to go ahead and do this. So everybody, I really hope that you enjoyed the video. Like, share, subscribe, and I will see you all next time.